How would it feel to lose 40 pounds? Even when you're over 40, you are a smart woman. You know you need to move more and eat less, but why don't you do it? Or maybe you think you are doing all the things and still not seeing the results you want. If this is the case, you are in the right place. Welcome to the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Simonen, and I help women over 40 lose weight for the last time. This podcast will teach you all about fitness, nutrition, and most importantly, your mindset. Plus, we have some special guests stop by to share their stories. Now on to today's show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast. Today's special guest has graduated with a degree in astrophysics, worked at a Fortune 50 company before founding her coaching practice. So I want to welcome today resilience coach Kristen Jekalek. Did I destroy your last name? <laughs> no, you got it. Jekalek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for everybody who's been listening, I am I just butcher last names. So I apologize for all the former guests, but I got this one right. <laughs> So Kristen helps high performers struggling with burnout to sustain the demanding career that they love without sacrificing health or well-being. Her work has appeared in Forbes.com and Entrepreneur.com. She is obsessed with Philadelphia's local food scene, both out to eat and in her own kitchen. So how is that working for you? Because with the quarantine, you're pro are you ordering out or are you making your own food? So I tell you what, Nicole, we have had a couple like um, reasons to celebrate recently. I live with my boyfriend. We had our one year anniversary and we thought like, oh, we'll order out like a fine dining meal from Forsythia because they have like great farm to table food, a great mm. chef. It's a great like local place through and through fine dining delivered just doesn't compare. So we're really sticking to cooking as many of our meals as we can. <laughs> and I get lots of local produce and meats and cheeses and all that stuff delivered as well. So I'm still eating locally. It's just a little bit more effort. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. We're doing the same thing. Um, not the fancy restaurants, but we're definitely <laughs> ordering from farmers markets and um, local butchers. And yeah. So I think today having you on this podcast is going to be very timely because as of today, we're recording this on May 7th. So whenever you're listening to it, we are just starting to slowly lift the stay at home orders in COVID-19. And I know stress levels are really high for most people. And so this is why I wanted to have Kristen on the show today. And you can connect with Kristen on LinkedIn and I will share all her um, links on the show notes page, which you can find at shapeitupfitness.com. So Kristen, tell me a little bit about, about your background and how you became a coach. First off, Nicole, thank you so much for hosting me on your podcast. I really appreciate this opportunity to connect with you and more people. So how I got into coaching um, is a little bit of a story. I was in my mid-20s. And I really felt like the world was my oyster. I was doing really well in my career. I was getting big promotions and raises every year. I was able to pay off my student loans every month and still save money. I mean, like I thought I had made it at 25. However, <laughs> I was honestly miserable. I wasn't excited about my work. I was pushing myself extremely hard in the gym, like five days a week. I was getting into nutrition. So I was into like really strict diets. And on top of that, as many women also struggle with, I had a, a severe eating disorder at the time. And the accumulated stress of trying to be like a type A high performer at work, pushing my body in the gym and in the kitchen, and then also having an eating disorder led to massive burnout in my mid 20s. And it took me a very long time to overcome that. Um, my burnout was extreme. It, got, it led to additional health issues that left me unable to even hold a job for about three years, which is really hard to do in your late 20s and early 30s financially. Right. Uh, so I've had to learn a lot about how to generate and sustain energy physically, mentally, and emotionally. And I just don't see enough of the right messages being shared with professionals who are looking to avoid and recover from hopefully less severe burnout than I had. Mm. So much of the common advice is like take more vacations and get more massages. And those things can be great tools in your box, but that's not really a comprehensive strategy for wellness and well-being. Right. Yeah. I think it's almost like putting a Band-Aid on the problem. You know, you really need to find the solution or not the solution. You need to find the root of the cause. Then you can have the solution to that. 
So um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was how women can avoid burnout and you really don't have to be a superwoman to get it all done. So do you want to speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. I mean, as women, we definitely have a lot of pressure to do everything. And many of us, um, especially people who are excelling um, in their careers, are perfectionists. We want to do everything and we want to do everything really, really well. And that can lead to a lot of pressure, not pressure from other people, but a lot of pressure from ourselves. Mm. So one thing I keep hearing a lot from women and from men when they hit like their mid thirties, their mid forties, um, they're exhausted all of the time. And they seem to believe that it's just part of the job. Everyone else goes through it. Their bosses went through it. It just seems to be something that we all have to grin and bear and just push ourselves through if we want to have um, career success, financial success for ourselves. We seem to believe that we're either going to have our career and that abundant life, or we're going to have to quit and leave it all behind for a quieter, simpler life of health and joy. <laughs> and I'm here to say that you can have both. When I um, recovered from my health issues, I wanted to go back to work as quickly as possible. And it was a huge milestone for me to be able to go back at first at 40 hours a week and then gradually building my hours up from there as I healed. So I, I learned a lot about how to sustain that energy I had brought back into my life while still performing at a high level and while still advancing my career as, as a high performer. Yeah, I think um, being a perfectionist, I've talked about this on the show before because I grew up in the ballet world and perfection was expected like it was just non-negotiable you either did it excellent or it didn't count <laughs> so um i get that i've never really been in the corporate world but i get that drive that high achievers have and you know and i think as a perfectionist we tend to think it's either black or white or it's all or nothing and there's really no gray in between and that is something hard to wrap your head around as a high performer because it's just been ingrained in you, whether it's a natural ingrainment, I feel, or like, uh, like um, in my situation, like ballet, like it was ingrained, like it was just, that was it, that was your option. <laughs> but um, I know I've learned over the years as I've gotten older that, you know, perfection is great to strive for, but there does come a lot of burnout with it. And sometimes doing like B plus or B minus work is okay too. Because I think we hold ourselves back a lot of time because we want it to be perfect. And we feel, I know for me personally, um, and I think a lot of higher achievers are like this, they feel like everybody's judging them because they're judging themselves more so than, you know, what probably other people are thinking of them. But um, yeah, finding the gray in between was interesting for me, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, because we want to be able to embrace um, the benefits of being a perfectionist. Like many of us have excelled in our careers because we work to such a high standard. I think the importance is also acknowledging the flip side of that, the dark side mm. of being a perfectionist and accepting that it does have a dark side and then acknowledging that and moving forward in a way that we retain the benefits, but we also support ourselves through the dark side of that, which is too much pressure and and also because we're judging ourselves so much i love what you said that we assume other people are judging us as well mm -hmm. realizing that people aren't holding us to the same standard and and um bringing less perfectionism to these external forces that really don't have the importance that we assume they do there's like a prioritization where yes there are certain things that we do need to give everything to create the absolute best work that we can. But on the flip side, we need to then give just as much attention to ourselves to really recover our bodies from the stress that we put ourselves through. And that's how we sustain productivity while also retaining our health and just feeling good through the process. Yeah, I think, um, I know, again, back to, I can only relate to me because I live in my own body, but um, like, I feel like there's lots of when a high achiever, like achieves something, it's like a high, high, but when we don't, it's like a really low, low, it's like very extreme. And I can see, I love that you call it the dark side. It just reminds me of star Wars, but <laughs> so um, talk a little bit about feeling guilty when you don't hit those milestones that you want. Yeah. So 
this, this feeling of guilt is really only something I see in women. I don't see men feeling guilty about things in their life. Like women tend to feel guilty um, either because they're working so hard and crushing it so hard at work that they are neglecting their family and their friends um, or they're prioritizing family and friends more and feeling guilty about neglecting work. Men typically don't feel guilty. They just see a problem and then they either change it or they accept what is in front of them. Mm. So when women are feeling guilty, we tend to assume that guilt is just this heavy emotion, this burden that we have to bear. We assume it's something we're just going to move through life with if we're not happy with the way things are going. And I want to reframe that guilt for everyone. Instead of assuming that guilt is this heavy emotion we have to live with um, because we're always going to be sacrificing something in our lives, I want to actually look at guilt as a message from our bodies, from our minds, to our conscious mind, where guilt is really saying, I care about something a lot, and I'm actually afraid that the people involved don't feel like I care for them. Like if you're so busy with work and you're prioritizing work, you feel guilty about not spending enough time with your partner or your kids, it's really you saying to yourself, I'm afraid they don't know how much I care about them mm. because I'm expecting myself to express my care in a certain way and I'm not doing that. Or I feel like they're expecting me to express my care in a certain way and I'm not doing that. So really guilt is a call to get creative about how else to express your care for people and how to show that to them. Maybe it's sending text messages more often. Maybe it's sending a funny picture. Maybe it's um, having more meals together. You know, it's about finding ways that fit into your other priorities. You know, maybe your constraint is time, so you need to find shorter time ways to do it, but really focusing in on expressing how much you care for people. And once you feel guilt as, as a call to express your care, it alleviates very quickly and it's not something you have to carry around with you for the rest of your life. It's very freeing to view guilt as simply a message. Yeah. I feel like guilt is like a red flag. Like it's, it's not like a horrible red flag. It's just like, hello, something needs attention here. You know, like yeah. that kind of a flag. Um, yeah. I feel like women in general, um, because of the way society has changed over the years, like, like, you know, I don't know how many years ago, but back in the day, we were just expected to raise the kids, clean the house and make dinner. And now I think those expectations are still on us, but now we have to have a career and now we have to have, you know, girl night, girl weekends. We have to pamper ourselves. We have all these expectations put on us and going to what you said about, um, you know, if your family's feeling neglected, um, so I have been diving into psychology a lot more. And one of the things that I found fascinating is, is that we can't cause other people's feelings. So, <laughs> right. And when I feel like as a mom, when you feel like you're feeling guilty, you know, again, that is the expectation you're putting on yourself, but that might not actually be the real case. Like if you actually went to the person that you're feeling guilty about, like say, for instance, not spending time with, and you said, Hey, do you feel like I spent enough time with you or get their opinion? I think sometimes you might be more aware that maybe you're don't need that much guilt. You know, um, I remember a couple of years ago, I saw something about a mom who was an entrepreneur and she was starting her own business and her kids, you know, of course they were little and they wanted um, lots of attention from mom. And she was struggling with the guilt of being a mom and a mom, mompreneur, whatever they call it now. But, um, one of the things she realizes is that she doesn't know the future, but she could also be putting a, like as a role model to their kids, meaning like mom needs this time to focus on her business. And she's being an example to those kids as to what moms can do rather than mom sacrificing her time and being like, Oh, I'll just push my work aside and, you know, focus on them. And, you know, of course there needs to be a balance. I feel it's not like you can ignore your children all day long and <laughs> expect them to, you know, turn out to be <laughs> relatively good kids. But, um, I thought that was interesting perspective to kind of twist it and not maybe twist isn't a best word, but like flip it a little bit that maybe your, you know, your daughter who's watching you work, that helps her become a CEO of some company or whatever she wants to do in life, you know? And I love that. And I think it goes back to our earlier conversation around priorities, because it sounds like that woman prioritized um, showing her daughter 
you know, the type of person that she hopes she becomes, whether, you know, being an example of the type of person she can become. And instead of expecting herself to do everything perfectly for this daughter, she's prioritizing what example she wants to set, what lessons she wants to pass on. And then she's embodying that. She's living it. I think that's beautiful. I love that example. Yeah. I think too, as a mom, like, I feel like you can't be at your your child's beck and call. And I know I'm assuming you don't have kids yet, but (laughs) like as a baby, of course, you know, you want to, but they have to learn that, you know, there's, there's times that they can spend with mom. There's times they can play by themselves. And, you know, and I think that me personally, I think that makes well-rounded children. We'll see. My kids are teenagers. I still got a couple more years of them baking. So we'll see what they turn out like. <laughs> you know, I've, I've also read some statistics. There have been um, like more recently studies are, are being done on how people spend their time. And when we um, compare like parents time um, now versus back in like the 50s and 60s, parents are actually spending more time with their children today than they used to. And I think people really need to let that sink in. And there's a multitude of, of reasons for that. Children are, it's less socially acceptable to let children go outside and play by themselves. So mm. they are at home more. But, um, you know, I think we need to look at the expectations we're placing on ourselves and ask if those are reasonable and also even healthy for the children, I think, like you were insinuating. Yeah. And I think, too, also, like, who designed these expectations? Like, where is the mom book that says that, you know, such and such has to happen? (laughs) That's like, you know, so that was probably a whole other topic for another day. (laughs) (laughs) So can you talk about a little bit more about creating balance in your life when you are in a stressful situation you need to stay productive. Yeah. So like, I think everything I talk about is going to come down to each person's personal priorities. You know, some women are going to prioritize um, family life more and other women are going to prioritize work more. And we're all going to have to swing back and forth from time to time. So if you find yourself in a time when you're prioritizing work a lot more, you're working long hours, um, hopefully it's not interfering with your sleep, but maybe it is interfering with your weekends and things. It really comes down to understanding the top things that you need to feel nourished and to feel like you're restoring yourself at the end of every day. So when I talk about our energy and burnout, I talk about it like digging a hole. Now, if we have like flat earth, we wake up every morning, ideally we have flat earth. And when we're stressed out, we're kind of digging ourselves into a hole. All right. We want to think of that stress as like lowering um, where we're standing. And then at the end of the day, if we're doing the right activities, um, then we're going to be filling that hole back in overnight while we're sleeping and while we're winding down for the evenings. Um, We also can work on reducing the amount of stress we feel in response to our daily activities, which will decrease the depth of the hole, making it easier to fill in each night. Hmm. Now, when we're not restoring ourselves, you know, and we come home at night and like we call it relaxing, we tend to just zone out in front of the TV. It's true that maybe you're not feeling stressed anymore, but when you're doing those activities that don't restore you, you're really not filling the hole back in very much at all. Mm. You're really just not digging any deeper and you can wake up the next morning and you're already in a hole, like literally in a hole in this example. And then you get stressed and you pick up that shovel and you start digging deeper. And the reason we get into burnout is because we've dug ourselves into such a deep hole that we really can't get out of it without a lot of extra effort. So Mm. it's those restorative things that are most important. How do we know what's actually restoring us? Now, here's where it gets tricky because we can't force ourselves into a restorative state of being. The body has um, two different states of being. We're either going to be in stress dominance, which is the fight or flight response. Uh, This is called the sympathetic nervous system, if you want to get into the biology of it. And our bodies contain the natural antidote to stress, which is the rest and digest response. And it's called the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. And our bodies are going to be in one or the other state of dominance. Most of us tend to live in that stressed out state far too often. Uh, And the only way to get into rest and digest healing response is to actually feel good. 
we can't force ourselves to feel good. We have to allow ourselves to feel good. So if you're coming home at night and you're forcing yourself to go for a run and forcing yourself to eat another diet meal, you're actually adding to the stressful response and you're actually digging that hole a little bit deeper. Now, you know, if it feels good to eat a whole pint of Ben and Jerry's, I'm not encouraging that because, you know, when we eat, um, this is probably a whole other conversation, right. I believe that we need to take into consideration how we feel after we consume, consume something. That's a very crucial part of how something makes us feel, not just while we're eating it. Um, so it's about finding those things that actually bring you a little bit of joy that actually make you feel good. It's about finding the activity, the, the exercise you enjoy, the foods you enjoy, the people you enjoy, activities that you enjoy, and making a little bit of time for those every day. For me, I love reading in bed at night. If I get 20 minutes of reading a good book in bed before I fall asleep, that is an extremely restorative thing for me to do. <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, with what you're saying about eating, you know, a whole pint of ice cream or whatever gallon of ice cream. Um, I think that we as humans, um, I know I talk about this a lot on my podcasts is, and with my clients is that, you know, we either are coming from the primitive brain or like a sophisticated brain. Whereas like the primal response is of course we want ice cream. Of course we want something that's going to make us feel good. But is that ice cream really giving you the results that you want long term? So kind of shifting gears is like, if you're talking about weight loss, you know, you can eat that ice cream and you're going to feel better, but you're not going to feel better long-term. So like really looking at what really, what do you want out of life and how you want to live your life, um, I think is important before you make those decisions. So I think being aware before you grab the ice cream, before you grab the spoon, that kind of thing. Um, and I do agree, like how you were talking about with the TV, I don't get me wrong. I love watching TV. But there's something, and I know they've done studies on this, so nothing that I can quote, but when you watch TV, you just kind of zone out. Like you just are like basically flipping the switch off. Whereas if you were doing something like reading a book that you actually have to visually, you know, move your eyes or yoga or some sort of deep breathing. I mean, that's like the big thing with all the watches now is like taking a breath. Um, but those things kind of getting in tune with you rather than just zoning out. I think there's a big, huge difference between, you know, like exactly what you said, being restorative, whether you're digging your hole or you're just sitting in the hole. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So Kristen, how can people find you? The best way to connect with me is on LinkedIn. Um, you can find my name by typing it in here. It's a little tricky to spell. Make sure you get it right. Um, and uh, that's where I post videos twice a week. And you can direct message me there. Um, and I love to connect with people one-on-one. -on -one. Awesome. All right. Are you ready for the speed round? Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So the first question is, what is your favorite vacation that you have been on? Oh, hands down, my favorite vacation ever was last year going to Iceland for 10 days. Mm. I got to see the Aurora Borealis in person, um, which was the whole point of the trip for me. I really wanted to do that. So it was just a dream trip. We rode Iceland to courses. We ate oh, local, wow. like traditional foods. We walked through, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm like blanking <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't even know. We did all kinds of great, wonderful things. It was the trip of a lifetime. Okay. For some reason, I think it's Iceland. Isn't there like this huge um, lake that you get in and it's like super warm all the time? Yeah, they have the, they have the Blue Lagoon. They have other hot springs. Um, we didn't go to the Blue Lagoon. We went to like the hot spring town that they have there. Okay. And this hike is just amazing because you're like through the mountains and there's just like steam coming off all around you. So it's cool. Gorgeous. So cool. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, so what is your favorite book? My favorite book is actually a series, and it is The Chronicles of Amber by Roger Zelazny hmm. for all the sci-fi and fantasy. Oh, books. cool. I'll have to check that out. Is it, is it kid appropriate? I might have to give it to my daughter. <laughs> um, depends on how old she is, but if she's 13. in her teens, yeah. It's, okay. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> um, what is your favorite time of year? Oh, man, you know, I really, really love the smell of fall when the leaves are falling and things are just decomposing a little bit, but they still smell kind of fresh. Um, yeah, I love the beauty of that time of year. Christmas. <laughs> yeah. 
what is your favorite movie? My favorite movie of all time, I'm going to say Shawshank Redemption. Ooh, okay. I can watch that one over and over. Cool. All right, last one. What's your favorite inspirational quote? My favorite inspirational quote is, this is one I use all the time, and it is, resistance rises the closer you get to a breakthrough, meaning things are going to be getting a lot harder before they get better, but if you just persevere, when you come out the other side of that, things are going to be phenomenal. Oh, I like that one a lot. I'm stealing that one. <laughs> Do you know who said that? I, I think it's just like an anonymous quote uh -huh. that's been shared so many times. We lost the origin. Oh, I like that very much. All right. So before we wrap up, do you have any tips for people, like three tips for people to avoid burnout? Yeah, I would say the number one tip, the number one thing that helped me on my journey to begin overcoming burnout was to understand that my emotions and feelings aren't a burden. They're actually important for my overall well-being and for me to sustain my health long term. I have to care about them. Mm. I would say the second tip is a follow on to that. And it is, you know, not that we're supposed to be like reacting to our emotions and living in our emotions all of the time. We want to be, we want to care about them. We want to be in touch with them, but we want to develop an understanding of them so that we can see them for what they really are. Not a way to live, but they're really just information bubbling up from our subconscious to our conscious mind. And we can develop a, a level of um, just responsiveness to, to them internally where we understand what's going on and then we choose how to move forward forward as mm. opposed to being reactive to them. And I would say the third tip for overcoming burnout is just finding more things that you enjoy in life and creating more space to do those things that just feel good for you. We really undervalue play and enjoyment and they absolutely are essential for a truly healthy life of well-being. Awesome. They are great tips <laughs> for sure. All right. Well, Kristen, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know the listeners got a lot of value out of this um, podcast. So thank you so much for being on. Nicole, this was so much fun. I would love to do this again. You're great to talk to. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks everybody for listening and I will talk to you soon. Hey, if you're loving this podcast, I want to hear from you. Head over to the Apple podcast and scroll all the way down at the bottom of the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast. Please write a review. I can't wait to see what you write. Once you're done with your review, head over to shapeitupfitness.com and find out how you can get started on losing the weight for the last time.